More than two-thirds of the Earth's surface is covered by water. Some waters are roaring oceans, some tranquil lakes, and some unforgiving seas. Every continent, every country, and indeed all of humanity rely on the world's waters for life. Oceans, seas, lakes, rivers, straits and gulfs all contain either salty or fresh water and host an ecosystem beneath the surface as complex and fascinating as that above. Some waters are salty, others are fresh. Some are still and lifeless while others are vibrant and flowing, offering life-giving water. This is the Sea of Galilee, a small body of water shaped like a harp, 21 kilometers long and 13 kilometers at its widest. The average depth is just 25 meters and you can drive around it in under an hour. It's the size of Lake George in Australia, Lake Windermere in the United Kingdom, and about one third of the size of the Hoover Dam in Colorado in the United States. It lies 200 meters below sea level and is supplied from natural springs beneath the surface and from the upper Jordan River with waters that flow from Mount Hermon, some 70 kilometers to the north. And then into the lower Jordan and to the saltwater Dead Sea, 140 kilometers south. Welcome to the Sea of Galilee. But the reason we're here, and why so many people come to here, is because the most important person who ever lived spent so much of his time around these shores, reaching out to people, preaching and bringing a new message of a kingdom. Have you guessed his name? I hope so. Jesus Christ. The Galilee region is one of the most picturesque areas in the Middle East. This, coupled with the historical and religious significance, makes it a popular destination for people and a gathering of cultures from around the world. The Galilee region is home to Nazareth, Cana, Tiberias, Capernaum, Bethsaida, the Golan Heights, the Jordan River, and of course, the Sea of Galilee. This body of water has many names. Some refer to it as Lake Galilee. It's also known as the Sea of Tiberias, Lake Gennesaret, the Sea of Ginesar, and the locals call it Kinneret. This body of water was on the ancient Via Maris trade route which linked Europe, Africa and Egypt with Syria and the rest of the Middle East. It has been the domain of some of history's greatest empires, including the Egyptian, Persian, Roman, Greek and Ottoman, and each have left their mark. This was a major centre of thriving agriculture and industry, with olive groves, vineyards, grain fields and orchards. In the first century, the lake had over 250 boats fishing these waters. The villages on the lake shore were famous for the fish sauce, which was exported all across the Roman Empire. And along the shoreline, there was all that one associates with a life at sea. I journeyed here to the beautiful Sea of Galilee, not as a tourist like many do, but I'm here because I want to explore a question. I want to investigate something about Jesus because so much of this area has affected the way we understand him, certainly impacted on his teachings. When we see him teaching, he uses illustrations that would be drawn from normal life here. The fishing methods on the lake of the various kinds, including the dragnet in one of the parables, all come from this area. 
and the crowds would very easily be able to move from village to village so that they could hear about him. You can almost picture them running from, from town to town as the news came, Jesus is in town, and he started to teach. And so there's something about this area that feels so very, very powerfully right in trying to explore Jesus Christ. But our story doesn't begin here by the lakeside when we investigate the story of Jesus. Jesus was born during a time of change and unrest in the political and economic leadership of this region. After Herod the Great died, his kingdom was divided among three of his sons and called Judea in the south, Galilee in the north, and Samaria between the two. These three sons, like their father, were client kings who ruled under the authority of the Roman Emperor Caesar Augustus. The leadership of the Roman client states were constantly under threat. Herod Archelaus ruled in Judea, which included Bethlehem, where Jesus was born, and Herod Antipas went on to rule Samaria and Galilee, which included the areas where Jesus was raised and lived for much of his life. This Catholic basilica in Nazareth is the largest in the Middle East and is built over the place where the angel Gabriel is said to have announced the coming of Jesus to Mary. Now the angel Gabriel visited Mary and she was at the time engaged to Joseph but a virgin. So it's not surprising that in Luke's gospel, the only one to record this particular incident, it's not surprising that she is troubled and shocked. Joseph is concerned that this might bring public disgrace to her and to the family. But there's something very special about what happens because it's described to her even though she's still a virgin, what will happen? The Holy Spirit will overshadow her, will somehow come and affect her life in such a way that a child is born. It's been the theme of so many Christian hymns and, and anthology and poetry down the years. Nowhere is it more powerful than in Stabat Mater. The truth is that she is a highly favoured lady. And those are the words that Mary is greeted with when she makes the journey up to the hill country to visit Elizabeth. Now her reason for going to visit Elizabeth is that the, 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 the angel Gabriel had assured her that not only was she going to have a child, but Elizabeth was. Now why is that so surprising? Well Elizabeth has been trying for a child for years. The Bible rather cruelly describes her as barren, as though she's never going to have a child but the news comes that she too will have a child. So when she comes to visit Elizabeth, Elizabeth greets her with this wonderful response that you're a highly favored lady and blessed are you among women. Blessed are you among women? Of course, Mary is blessed and we haven't always acknowledged that. I would need to be the first among Protestants to say that we haven't always given the place to Mary that we ought to in the Christian tradition. We've been so keen to get on to tell the story of the gospel of the, the love of God in Jesus Christ that we've forgotten that it took Mary to be part of that story. And the great thing about Mary, above all else that I acknowledge as being superbly rememberable in, in, in the life of the story of the church, is her faithfulness her faithfulness to God, her faithfulness to her son, her faithfulness to the cause that God had given to her. She's there, of course, at the beginning, 
But she's with Jesus all the way through at Cana at the first of the miracles throughout his ministry, pondering in her heart the things that were true when he was lost in the temple. And then most of all, with him through the cross and resurrection. And I might add, there is much to say that she was probably there in the life and development of the early church when Mary would be given a significant place in the life of that church. So we have Mary, we have Elizabeth, both giving birth to boys, boys that in their own way would change the world. Elizabeth would give birth to John the Baptist, the one who would speak in the wilderness, a very powerful message, and in turn baptise the other, Jesus, who would come to be identified and understood by many to be the saviour of the world. This is the grotto of the Church of Annunciation and is said to be the place where the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary. Today it's a place where people of all ages and from all nationalities and cultures come to express their devotion. But what is it that draws people to this place? And what does it really represent? I'd like to offer a suggestion that it's a quality of Mary and indeed Joseph, obedience. It's the obedience that they expressed in their life. Obedience is one of the major themes. We see it again and again. The obedience that will be part of following Jesus. This obedience would go on to become a characteristic of many Christian orders. After the Annunciation and before Jesus was born, the Roman Emperor Caesar Augustus called for a census that required all people to return to the place of their birth. Between the time of the Annunciation and the birth of Jesus, Joseph along with Mary were required to return to Bethlehem to be accounted for. And it was in Bethlehem in Judea where Jesus was born and the Christmas story takes place. Subservient to the Roman Emperor, but keen to assert his authority as the ruler of this client state, Herod moved quickly to address any threat to his rule. The slaughter of the innocents recorded in Matthew's Gospel certainly rings true to the jealous nature of Herod. When Herod died, the Gospel tells us Mary and Joseph, with Jesus, returned to the land. But when they heard that Herod's son Archelaus was ruling in Judea in the place of his father, they decided to return to Nazareth in Galilee rather than Bethlehem. So it's here, in the city of Nazareth, where Jesus was raised by Mary and Joseph. Throughout his ministry, to some Jesus was a teacher, to others one who brought healing, a miracle worker and a remarkable storyteller. To his adversaries, he was a thorn in their side, a religious, political and social revolutionary who needed to be silenced. In the first century, there were others who claimed to be the Messiah, sent by God to fulfil what we now call the Old Testament prophecy. All those things seem to mean that there were many different ways in which he was perceived. To the close disciples, he was a friend. He certainly was a prophet and so on. And there was a developing sense of awareness as to who he was as he went through his ministry. What was it, however, that set him apart? What was it that made him stand out from all the rest? Why do people, after all these years, through all the centuries and in all the different cultures, why do people still take his teaching seriously? Jesus was comfortable teaching in open spaces to large crowds and also in small intimate settings with an audience of just a few. Common to Jesus' teaching was how he encouraged, corrected, motivated and equipped the many people he encountered. Jesus taught by doing, by telling stories and by leading by example. The teachings of Jesus cannot be ignored. They were relevant to his day and remain of importance today. 
Jesus told stories with universal themes that spoke with clarity in his day and which would address the questions and struggles of all people throughout the ages. One of his most recognisable groups of teachings is said to have taken place here on the Mount of Beatitudes. grounds actually of the church that is built supposedly on the hillside where Jesus delivered his famous sermon. They begin with the be attitudes. I say it that way because I want to separate the two words, be and attitudes. Not because it's necessarily right to do that in English, but because actually it remarkably tells us that there's a link between the blessing of God and the experiences we have in life. In Luke's gospel, we have blessings and woe. But in Matthew's gospel, Jesus is recorded as talking about being blessed or blessed as the old word used to say. I know that may not be the right word, but blessed seems to indicate the spiritual importance of these particular values. You are blessed, blessed when the poor in spirit, when you mourn, when you're weak, when you're merciful. In that place, there is real blessing. One writer who was reflecting upon the, the, the Sermon on the Mount and particularly upon the Beatitudes suggested one of the helpful ways of understanding them might be to replace the word blessed, however important that word is, with these words. You are in the right place. You're in the right place when you're poor in spirit. You're in the right place when you mourn. You're in the right place when you're meek. You're in the right place when you're merciful. It's a very, very interesting thought, isn't it? And then you have at the end of that beatitude list, you have those words that you're, you're in the right place when you're persecuted. This is the radical nature of the teaching of Jesus. Well, the Sermon on the Mount is gathered for us and then it concludes in Matthew's Gospel with the editing of the Gospel suggesting that when he'd finished his sermon, the crowd were amazed, amazed because he taught with authority and then says, not as their own teachers of the law. But where did this authority, wisdom and insight come from? Before the start of his ministry, Jesus went to the River Jordan to be baptised by John the Baptist, a member of his own extended family. John, of course, was the son of Elizabeth, related to Mary, the mother of Jesus, who went to see her after the visitation of the angel Gabriel. This is a full circle of affirmation of God's divine intervention in the lives of their mothers. The question we have to ask when we're at a place like this is who is baptised? By whom is that person baptised? And what does it really mean? Well, who is baptised is simple Jesus. But gosh, why would he come here and why to John? Because John the Baptist, not only his cousin, but the one that is preparing the way after so many years without a prophet, now declaring the good news of God, coming and declaring that news. And Jesus goes along with all the people to hear. But what does it mean? It is about identification, total identification with the human race, with his disciples and with all those who would be followers. But something also happens at the baptism that would never be forgotten to anyone present. As he comes up out of the water, there is a, a voice from heaven that cries out, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is the daughter of the voice. It is the same voice that we will hear at the transfiguration. It is a voice of affirmation. And Jordan becomes the start of his ministry. 
but after here, he is taken into the place of temptation. It was God who led Jesus to the wilderness and allowed him to be tested. And we're told that for 40 days and 40 nights, he was fasting and in a place where, where he wasn't experiencing all the good things of life, anything but those things. And in that moment of temptation, it's important to see that it wasn't the devil that took him there. It was God that led him into that place. I think that's very helpful in terms of our lives because temptation is one of those early aspects in the ministry of Jesus that is so very, very, very much related to our own lives. 40 days, you can see the link, can't you, to the Old Testament stories of how the, the children of Israel for 40 years knew what it was to be in that place of wandering. It's such a critical number and crit critical time and experience for Jesus. I want to tell you that I think, in my own understanding of this, this is a real preparation for the ministry that will follow. For we have three temptations. First of all, there is the temptation about stones. The devil suggested that Jesus could turn stones into bread. Well, of course he could, but he chose not to. And the reason he chose not to is summed up in the scripture from Deuteronomy that he quoted, people don't live by bread alone, but by every word of God the Father. That truth is a very important one. And so Jesus chooses a way that is better. The second temptation is that he is whisked from this place to the highest point on the temple in the holy city. And, and the, the temptation this time is that the devil himself quotes scripture. Here he's told that uh, from Psalm 91, that if he should fall from the top of that pinnacle, that the angels would come and gather him up and there's nothing to fear from that moment. Well, Jesus is very straightforward. He says, we must not put God to the test. And that would be one way in which that happened. But that's not the last temptation. There is a third temptation. And he takes him to a high mountain, overlooking all the kingdoms of the earth, as it were. And he says, if you'll just worship me, the devil says, if you just worship me, you can have the lot. But you know, Jesus' response is that we should worship God and worship him alone. So after these moments of temptation, something that would be important in the life of the early church was true, that you can overcome temptation. The writer to the Hebrews made it clear that Jesus was tempted at all points as we are, yet without sin. So right at the beginning of his ministry, he identifies practically with the experience of our lives and shows us a better way, shows us a way that will be demonstrated throughout his ministry. After his experience in the wilderness, facing evil and overcoming the obstacles put before him, Jesus was ready to begin his public ministry, a mission that would stretch throughout history to influence not only his generation, but up to our own. Why is it that Jesus has not been ignored? His teachings, miracles and the example of his life have resulted in Jesus being commonly referred to as the most influential person of all time. His influence is acknowledged by billions of people around the world and for many generations spanning from world leaders to high profile celebrities to individuals from all nations and cultures, I want to ask the question why? Why did a person said to have come from God choose to walk this earth? Why did people reach the conclusion that he was more than a man and many that he was the son of God? Why did this man of Galilee, who told remarkable stories and gathered followers around him, live alongside people in the first place? 
Christians have reached the conclusion that he is a key to understanding life and offering hope to people. Why is Jesus Christ considered by many to have laid down his life and then be raised from the dead? He chose a public mission that would result in him open to question, ridicule, and ultimately a public death on a cross. The message of Jesus, therefore, is not privatized. It is shared through him to the ends of the world. Now, why is it that billions of people around the world make sense of their lives through the person of Jesus Christ.